you don't use a microphone, and what you would do is you'd have it kind of close. It's like this. You can't really hear it, but here you can kind of hear it. Is that all right? That's okay. And if, you, if you're if you not used to doing it like this, if you wanted to have a seat, I can sit you down with a little microphone stand. You can just sit in front of it, however you want to do. Yeah. Feelings. Can you hear me? Okay. Good. There it is. Yeah, these up here probably would be the ones to take down. That's good. Is it still on? Still on? If anyone's ever been in my office, you'll see that I definitely have a love of bees. And um, one day, this gentleman came into the lobby, and I happened to be running the front desk for a minute. And uh, he said, do you ever do any bee type of programming? And I'm like, well, why don't you come back to my office, and we'll talk about it, <laughs> and show him all the bees that I have in my office. And so Hugh Madison is a master beekeeper, and um, we're very excited to have him here. This is the first time. I've ever scheduled any kind of a presentation like this, and so I'm very excited. My name is Lynn Drinkwater, and I'm the SEC Program Coordinator here. And so you might hear some thumps and stuff as we're talking, and it's only because they're changing out the air conditioning unit upstairs. Working with the county, we never know when they're coming to cut the grass or fix something, and it could be as soon as you call them, or it could be a little bit later when, when they don't have other emergencies to have to deal with. So just to let you know, and that's why it's a little on the a stuffy side in here is because they had to turn it off in order to change it out. So anyway, without further ado, here is Hugh Madison. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Does that, does that working? Am I got it close enough? Okay. So um, I am a retired Air Force Chief Master Sergeant, retired in 1985, and um, we were living in Florida, but my wife's husband... Oh, I'm their husband. The wife's father was getting sick a lot, and she was coming back and forth from Florida up here. So one day on the way back, um, I said, this doesn't make any sense. Let's go home. That's all she needed. So she was raised on this farm we live on, and I hardly know how to spell farm. 
So when we got here, I said, well, what am I going to do? So I started checking around, and I remembered I had a buddy when I was in high school in Aberdeen who, who was a third-generation beekeeper. So I contacted Billy, and I said, I need a hobby, buddy. And he said, come on out. And that got me going. He was my mentor. Yeah, he taught me everything I know about bees. And he passed away in 2016, but we, I really miss him. But anyhow, that's how I became a beekeeper. I needed a hobby. And I made it a big time hobby. So um, I kind of like this um, t title because I did fall in love with honeybee. When you hear the word honeybee, what comes to your mind? Would it be a stinger? Would it be honey and biscuits or cut comb honey? Probably think of one, all of those, right? So what you should think about is pollination. This is where the honeybee is the most important thing that we have going, is pollinating our flowers and trees and gardens. You know, I uh, first started out keeping bees, and I put gloves on and veils and jackets, tied my pants up and all that. But, you know, I got so I wasn't scared of bees. You don't believe me? We make beards out of bees. And hats, boots, suits. Guess what? Honey bee bikinis. Get ready for this. Bee cups. So we're not scared of honey bees. Honey bees very important to our economy. One third of the food we eat must be pollinated by honey bee. And you said, you notice I didn't say should or would or must be pollinated by the honeybee. And they contribute to our economy, like $14 billion into our U.S. agriculture each year. So honeybees are important, and we would plead for anybody, please help save the honeybees. Honeybees are a favorite pollinator for several reasons. First, they can be moved easily. You can put them on the back of a truck or a trailer and move them off to the, a crop that needs pollinating. They forage. They forage for nectar and pollen. So that's the thing. The pollen is, uh, you know, how you get the pollination going. And then you, the nectar is what they make the honey from. And then the one reason they are uh, good pollinators is they have a long tongue. They can get deep down into the flower. And they do forage for a big area. They can go one to two miles, sometimes up to three miles radius of their hive. It takes a lot of work to make a pound of honey. If you took one bee, it would take her 2, 2 million visits to a flower, which would equal 55,000 flying miles to make one pound of honey. That's a lot of work. This is a honey bee on a buckwheat flower. I plant buckwheat periodically. To, they go out and they collect the nectar and make buckwheat honey. Has anyone ever eaten buckwheat honey? Very good honey, and it has a very distinct taste from the regular honey you eat. But if you're eating it for your health, it's rated number one in the world, buckwheat honey. It's real dark, looks like molasses. Hey. Honey is used for a lot of things. Cleopatra, you know, she wanted to stay young and beautiful, so she mixed honey and milk, took baths. I don't know if it helped or not. Um, Queen Anne shampooed her, honey, her with ha honey and olive oil. And we were talking a while ago, honey was found in King Tut's tomb, still edible. I don't know if I would have eaten it or not, but honey never spoils. How about honey as a love potion? In Babylonia, mead was required to be in the groom's dowry. So honey could have these qualities. I can't pronounce that word, but they may have those qualities. So is that where we got the term honeymoon? Maybe. <laughs> so bees are probably, I, I would say, they are the only insect in the world that produces food for human consumption. We had some famous beekeepers, presidents, detectives, philosophers, scientists, 
This fellow here, Carl von Frisch, he got a Nobel, Nobel Peace Prize when he did a study on how bees communicate. And he came up with the bee dance. He learned that the bees uh, communicate by dancing. And I'll explain that later. But he got a Nobel, Nobel Peace Prize for that work he did. They also had some bees at the White House some few years back. But, you know, that's in the past. Benefits of honey. Pollination is the main benefit of the honeybees. And honey, I mean benefits of the bees, honey is the second benefit, which probably most of us like is the honey. Health benefits. Now, you can go to a health food store and buy pollen as a nutrient supplement. I heard it's good for you. I heard it tastes awful. <laughs> but you can buy it. And it's good for allergies. If you... Um, eat honey, and you have allergies, they won't go away, you know, overnight. But when, like when I came here in 1992, came back, I was taking Allegra for allergies, and I started eating honey, and I don't, I had, pollen doesn't bother me anymore. So you got to have local honey. Local honey means if it's within 50 miles. So you can get rid of your allergies by consuming honey. I eat honey. I don't eat it, but I put it in my coffee every morning. So it's, a, it's good to get honey every day. So let's uh, take a look in the beehive. The honeybee colony is a three-cast system. They have two females and the male. Two females is the queen. The one in the center is the queen. Then you have the worker. Then you have the drone, one the male. Each has its own characteristics, roles, and responsibilities, which makes it a three-caste system. A lot of people argued it's just a two-caste system because it's a male and a female, but this is a three-caste system. So we'll take a look at the three um, individuals in, this, in the hive. The first thing we want to look at is um, the queen bee, and she is Her Majesty. She controls everything. She's the heart and soul of the hive. Everything happens because of her. Everything. No queen, the colony dies. And the queen has only two primary purposes in life. One is to regulate the colony. She does that through the use of pheromones. Does anyone not know what a pheromone is? It's a scent, a chemical scent. So she controls the colony by emitting these scents from her body. And her second uh, purpose is to lay eggs lots of eggs. She can lay up to 1,500 eggs a day. So a beekeeper does not go into a beehive just for fun. He goes in there to inspect the hive. And what we do when we go in there is the first thing we want to know is do we have a queen? The second thing we want to know is she healthy? So you can go in and look for a queen. You may not be able to find her, but if you find eggs you know that a queen has been there within three days. So there's only one queen in the colony. She's the largest bee there, long, graceful body, and she's the only female with fully developed ovaries. The worker bees do have ovaries, but they're not developed. The queen in her court, she has to have attendants all the time. They feed her, they groom her, they keep her clean. I always like to say she don't have to go buy groceries, she don't have to do the laundry. She don't have to do anything like that because the um, her attendants take care of her. Here you have a queen bee right in the center, and you know, there's all these little worker bees around her. They're making sure that she's being taken care of. The queen does have a stinger, but she won't sting you. She will sting other queens. There might be other queens born at the same time, or there might be a queen emerge from a queen cell and there's other queen cells around and she will go around and sting those cells to make sure there's no other living queens there. She has a, a, a long lifespan, but a good beekeeper will make sure that he replaces his queen or the hive swarms at least every other year. So the life cycle for a queen, uh, the egg is laid takes 16 days for the egg to um, hatch and for the uh, egg to mature into a full-grown worker bee or queen bee. 
Within five days of her birth, she takes a mating flight. And after her mating flight, she comes back. Within five days of her mating flight, she starts laying eggs. Do you guys have any questions? Stop me. Okay. Well, you wouldn't just buy a queen bee. Uh, you would have to buy a colony of bees, okay? And they, they come in, uh, we call packages, which would be like three pounds of bees and a queen. Or you can buy this one here, bought a nuke. It's a um, package that was put in a five-frame box, and they grew, they laid eggs, built out their honeycomb, and got some brood in there. So that's how you get a colony of bees. You just... Oh yeah, oh yeah. They 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 are actually the worker bees are responsible for the gender of the queen bees, and I'll show that to you on that one. So um, the, here's how the mating flight works. She goes out to uh, the drone congregation area. We call it the DCA. Out there in this congregation area, there's all these drones. You know what a drone is, right? He's the male. So they just out there just flying around and, and you know, you know, just having fun. These queens start showing up. So they line up behind the, the queen and they will mate with her. And she will mate with as many as 15 drones. Okay. And then she returns to her colony. And once she gets back to her colony within five days of her mating, she starts laying these eggs, starts building her um, colony. Okay, so um, when you have a queen, you, you a lot of times you can't find her in the hive because she just blends in with the other bees. So we have a system, a color system, where we will take and put paint on the on the thorax to identify what year she was put in that hive. Like years in in one or six, we'd have white there where that red is, and this queen here is marked the proper color because she was born in 2023. Say okay. So that, and if, if you want to try to remember that, just say, will you raise good bees? White, yellow, red, green, blue. That's just, you know, a way to find the bee when she's in there and also to know how she how old she is. Because a lot, a lot easier to find a bee if she has uh, color on her thorax. Now, some queens live to retire they sitting around on the, in the rocking chair, and they just talking. Well, all those beans of offspring, you'd think at least one would come and visit. So that was the queen bee. Now let's talk about the worker bee. She does it all. That's why they call her the worker. She feeds and nourishes the honeybees before they're born and after they're born. Sometimes you get a little fellow here who don't want to eat and say, you know the rules. No honey till you finish your pollen. So, yeah. so the worker bees forage. They go out and they forage for pollen. They get nectar. They bring in water. And they bring in propolis. You see the yellow on, the, on their legs? They have little baskets on the back of their back legs. And when they get on a flower, they just keep stuff, breaking that stuff off and breaking it down into those baskets. And what these bees here have is two full baskets of pollen to take back to their hive. So when they get back there, they go in and they rake it out, go back for some more. They um, bring in um, nectar. They have a different way of bringing in nectar. I'll tell that to you later. Uh, they bring in water. They uh, use water when they have new brood in the colony. And they use water, and they also use water for cooling the hive. They'll bring it in and put it on top of the frames and let it go down and cool a little bit. Um, does anyone know what propolis is? Propolis is, we call it bee glue. They go out to some leaves have a, like a resin on it. And they'll bring this stuff back, and if they have a crack in the hive or a hole or something like that or a dead mouse or whatever, they will put this stuff all over it. They 
patch holes with it. It's called propolis. They, they bring it back just like they bring back uh, pollen. So they've carried the, bas the pollen in the baskets, as I mentioned to you. You see this one's loaded down. It's going in for more. I've, a I've actually sat out in front of the hives and watched these bees come in. It's like watching a B-52 trying to land. You know, they're just so heavy. They don't know whether they're going to make the entrance or not. Very interesting. Now, how do they bring the nectar back? They go out and get buckets full. Not really. The honeybee has two stomachs. They have a um, honey stomach and they have a digestive stomach. So what they do is they go and uh, you can see they go down the tongue. They suck the nectar up, put it in their honey stomach, and take it back to the colony. So that's how they transport nectar. Here the bees are working in pollinating. Got that tongue down in there getting the nectar. <laughs> we talk about pollination. You know, some people are a little bit lax. How could you get a D in pollination? And bees are a little bit modest. They can meet out on the flower and say, tell me, does this pollen make my thighs look too fat? So the worker bee has her jobs all laid out for her from the time she's born until she dies. So in the first couple of days of her lifetime, she's busy cleaning cells and going around keeping brood warm. Brood is the baby bee, the, the bee that's being developed. Um, days three to five, they feed the older larvae. Six to 11, feed younger larvae. On days 12, these bees actually develop a wax gland where they um, put off wax flakes. This is how they build the honeycomb. They only are able to do that for about five days in their lifetime. So that's a very important thing. They build honeycomb with it, and during those days, Bees transport food within the hive. On day 18, they progress down to um, the entrance, and they become what they call guard bees. So they will watch, see if there's any intruders coming in. They'll alert, alert the other colonies and other members of the colony, and they'll come down to help them. So on day 22, this is what we call, a, they become field bees. They actually go out, visit the flowers, pollinate the flowers, collect the pollen, the nectar, the water, and the propolis. So from day 22 until their deaths, they are field bees, so they don't do anything in the hive. And then in a season like we just got through, which we call the honey flow, where the nectar is high and the bees are bringing it in, their life expectancy is like 35 to 45 days. So that's the reason that the queen has to keep laying so many eggs over and over and over again keep the colony strong. So during their collection period, as I just said, their life expectancy is about 35 days. They meet on the flyer, start talking, hey, how you doing, what's new? Oh, you know, same old thing, work until you die. So we talked about the queen and the worker, and now we talk about lover boy, the drone. He's a... Um, Kind of a funny looking bee. Small population. You had a 60,000 bees in your hive, you might have 500 drones. A lot of people mistake them for the queen, but I don't know how they do that. Kind of shaped like a barrel, has great big eyes. So, what the drone doesn't do, he does not go out and forage for food because he doesn't have any way to bring it back. He doesn't build honeycomb because he doesn't make any wax, have any wax glands. They're often called lazy, gluttonous, and incapable of caring for himself because the worker bees care for the drone. They take care of it. He, what he does do, he mates. This is his only purpose in life, his only purpose. He's a high-maintenance individual, but the bees have to tolerate him. Why do they have to tolerate him? Because they may need a new queen. The only way to get a new queen is, you know, a laying queen is to be mated by the drone. He doesn't have any stingers, so he can't protect himself. Now, these drone bees are known to local, uh, frequent local clubs on Saturday night. 
So they go in this um, in these clubs, and uh, I'll show you what happens in there in a minute. So here we talked about the uh, drones mating area. Here's how it occurs: goes outside, mid-flight. They're just flying around, two or three hundred feet high, and they're back in that drone congregation area we're talking about. And it's about one mile from where they live. And this is an actual picture of a drone mating with a queen. I would love to have a moving picture of that, but unable to get one in. And here we go. They're out in the drone congregation area, and the drone's behind the queen. <laughs> I can't well wait to tell the guys about this. Probably his last thought, you know? That was his last thought, because when the drone mates with the queen, he dies. You don't want to come back as a drone. So the drone dies after mating. So, and while they were in the bar, you know, the bartender told them, hey, from what I hear, you don't want to get lucky. And you know, if the, if the drone does not mate with a queen and die, when the fall comes, the worker bees kick them out. They actually run them out. I've seen it happen. They will run them out because they don't want to feed them all winter. They got no use for them in the winter time. They don't have to listen to them and say what's for dinner anymore. So where does the honeybee live? This is a honeycomb. You can see the cells. Um, these are the cells. You can see the little white stuff. That is um, larvae that the, where the queen has laid eggs and the, the eggs have hatched and become larvae. Here's a worker bee. Uh, might be some nectar in some of these cells. So this is a, a um, honeycomb. This, if you found honeybees in the wild, which you probably really won't, this is what a honeybee hive would look like. They actually build a honeycomb straight down. They're very smart at putting this honeycomb, you know, right back to back. They build their cells as a hexagon. And so if you see one of those, let somebody know. I've seen one one time on a uh, pine tree up in, um, I think it's Carthage. So here's what a normal hive bee, a beehive would look like. You have this, a box. This was invented by Mr. Langstroth. So you have a base down there, and then you have a, a bottom board. Then you have a brood chamber. Brood chambers, this is a brood chamber here. That's where the bee, the queen lays her eggs. The brood, the eggs are hatched. The brood develops into a bee. And then this, uh, these two boxes here are called uh, honey supers. That's where the bees put their surplus honey, cap it over. And then, of course, you got the, um, the top, the inner cover, and the top. So it, you know. Most of these you'll see painted uh, white. Or most, a lot of people are painting them in uh, lavender or uh, fancy colors anymore. You don't want to paint one black or red or brown. They don't like dark colors like that. So the honeybees try to keep the hive at a constant temperature, especially where the queen is. Here we see the worker bees working. Now, here we remember the honeybee brings in the nectar in her honey stomach. What they're doing here is one bee is passing the nectar over to another bee and then passing it back. They keep passing it back and forth until they get it to a moisture content of 17.2%. Once they do that, then they put it in the cells and cap it over. It is now honey. It's not honey until that stuff is put in the cell and capped over. So how do bee, honeybees communicate? They don't use cell phones, but that one does. Honeybees communicate two ways. The first way is they communicate by smell. They use um, pheromones. And this um, is a nascent of gland. They actually put their little honeys up in the air and they start fanning and they let these scents loose. And depending on how much they let out at a time is what they're telling other bees. It might be, hey, we're being attacked. Hey, you lost your way. Come this way. They can communicate by putting out these um, pheromone smells. 
and she's up, she's got up her thing up in the air there, and she's fanning like crazy to get the scent out. And they communicate by dancing. Remember the Dr. Von Frisch? So they have two types of dances. It's called the round dance, and basically what they do is they're just going around. They come back and get on the, the frame. They're just going around and around and around. And what they're doing is they're telling the other bees that, hey, I found a good source of food, nectar, or whatever. And it's within 60 yards of the hive. But I can't tell you what direction to find. But they know they got some within 60 yards. So that's the round dance. Then you have the waggle dance. And what they're doing here is they're just going, doing a figure eight, you know, like that. And they will be on the frame, but they will be running towards the sun. And what they're doing is they're pointing towards the sun and they're telling that the bees are within a certain, that they're telling the bees that the source of honey or nectar is farther than 60 yards. And this is the direction to go. And the, far, the faster that they waggle and go around in this figure eight, the better the source is. So they can get really excited when they find a good source of, uh, of nectar. Does everybody understand that? It is. I mean, this guy, that he studied these bees to find out that's what they were doing. Of course, some of these bees, I have no idea where she's telling us to go. And more dancing. So here's the setup of the honeycomb. You got the egg. It looks like a real tiny piece of rice. And when the queen lays the egg, she lays it in such a way that it sticks right straight up in the bottom of the cell. Then you have the larvae. The, set, the egg hatches on the third day. The larvae stays a larvae for about six days, and then it stretches out into a pupa. And when it stretches out into a pupa, the bees put wax on top of it. And the, the honeybee develops from that stage on, sealed in wax. And you can see there's um, pollen here, nectar. So that's pupa, egg, pupa, larva, or egg, larva, pupa. And then this is kind of the cycle. The egg, the worker feeds the hatched larvae, larvae reaches full growth, worker seals, larvae becomes a pupa. When she comes out, she's a full grown bee. And, um, it takes it takes 16 days for a queen to be born from an egg to a full maturity. It takes 21 days for a worker bee to be born from an egg to maturity. And for a drone bee, it takes 24 days. The basic body parts of the um, honey bee, she has three basic body parts, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. She has five eyes, six legs, four wings. She has three, two compound eyes on the side of her head. And then she has three ocella eyes on the top of her head. Why does she have to have two sets of eyes? They work in the dark a lot, right? So they have to have eyes for seeing out when they're flying and also for when they're working in the hive. So on the abdomen, that's where the stinger is. The stomach is in here. Um, the baskets, the pollen baskets are back here on the back legs. So this is the makeup of the queen body, or the honeybee body. And these are the um, way the, the eyes look, the worker. See how big the drone eyes are? They're called compound eyes, the ones on the side of their heads. So the honeybees have seasons. They have spring, summer, fall, and winter. So what happens in the spring? They've been in the hive during the winter. The queen has not been laying any eggs. They've been eating honey, just lay back, watching TV and all this. Come February, usually around February, the worker bees tell the queen, you got to get busy. So what she does, she starts laying eggs. She lays eggs, she lays eggs, she lays eggs. So pretty soon... What happens is they have a hive council meeting and they say we're overcrowded. 
So we've got to do something. So what they do is they start developing queen cells, raising new queens. And about two days before the new queens are supposed to be born, the old queen will take half of that colony and leave. They just go. And usually they will go on a limb or in the mailbox or in a wall somewhere. And when they get located in one of those places, they send out scout bees to find where we can build a new home. And when the scout bees come back, they'll do the dance, you know, bees will fall and they'll send a couple more scouts out and they'll check it out. Oh yeah, it's good. So pretty soon the swarm will go to where they found this new location. So that's called a swarm and that's when they're taking the population down so they have room to grow. No, you don't. But if they swarm and you're lucky enough to see them, you got another hive of bees and you got a brand new queen in the old, in the old hive. So you can catch them. It's a, it's a pretty interesting thing to do. Yeah, you got to have something to put them in, you know, when you catch them. I had uh, I have several times I've had um, hives get way up on a pine tree limb, way out on a limb, and you can't get them down. So my brother-in-law is a pretty good shooter. So I go down and get him. I set me a box down below the swarm, and he'll shoot right behind that swarm and jar them, and they come down. I'll get down on my hands and knees and find the queen, put her in the box, and the rest of them go in there like little soldiers. It's amazing. So that's what happens in the spring. This is, I mean, this, that's probably, that's probably five pounds of bees there and up here. That's a, that's a good find if you find some. And you can handle, when they're in this situation here, you can go out with a cup, go up there, get a cup full. Or if they're on a limb that you can cut off without, you know, jostling them, you can actually cut the limb, walk it over to your box, and shake them in there. They try to get her right in the middle. In fact, she, they won't even go around the limb and, you know, gather until the queen is there. So, yeah. And in Texas, you know, everything's big. So when they swarm, they're going to go to places like walls. Here's the, here's the bees. They went and swarmed, went in, found a little hole in the, house somewhere where they could get in, went into the wall, started building their honeycomb, and started raising, you know, their family and making honey and brood and all that. Um, some guys will go and get those things out. I don't have any desire to cut a wall open and try to get the bees out because it's a real mess. So when I was talking about preparing the swarm, the bees will take a cell one of the cells in here, and they will make what we call queen cells. It looks like a peanut. And they'll take that cell and expand it so that the new queen can be born in there. And then they start treating the egg that's in the cell with royal jelly. Royal jelly. Constant royal jelly. And uh, that's where most of the royal jelly comes from is queen cells. So, um, this, oops. That is a, I don't want to go back to that one. See that cell right there? That's a closed, those are all queen cells. And usually um, the bee sometimes will want to supersede a queen because she's not doing good. So they'll put their cells probably up in the, like in the middle of the frame. But when they're getting ready to swarm, they're always down close to the bottom. And those cells... They'll open up, uh, the queen will emerge about two days before the swarm will go out. This is what a queen cell looks like inside. So you can see all that royal jelly, royal jelly. And the royal jelly comes from a gland on the worker's head. The worker bee produces that royal jelly from a, from a gland on her head. So this is the pupa for the queen. See how big it is? And it, it's going to grow into this thing here. This is a queen cell seal. So in the summertime, everything is stable. The population is stable. They're gathering nectar and pollen. Brood rearing is just constant. And the temperature is constant. So everything's running along smooth in the summertime. 
Then in the fall, the population of the hive declines. They got their winter storage all done, taken care of. They got, we call it surplus honey in there for them to get through the winter. If they don't have it in there, then use the beekeeper. Got to make sure they got enough honey on there. And it usually takes about 60 pounds to get them through a winter. Limited brew. They kick the drones out. They all gone. In the winter time, the the bees do not hibernate. They do what we call cluster. They will get as close to the food as they can, and all the bees they'll get the queen right in the middle, and all the bees will get around her, and they just move their wings back and forth to keep the heat in there. So the honey consumption, they begin eating honey. You know what they got stored? No brood rearing, no queens laying eggs. Try to maintain the temperature. If you could get your hive to be like that all winter long, it would be good. But what happens is the sun comes out, it warms up the front, they start flying out to look, everything goes all right. So it's better to have a good solid winter time where they don't get out than it is to have them fly. And the bees are bothered by pests. This is the worst thing that could ever happen to the honeybee is to get varroa mites in this little bitty bug and looks like a tick and what it does it gets in the cell where the brood is growing the bee is growing and they suck out all the nutrients in the in the the bee and when the bee emerges she comes out with no wings what good is a honeybee with no wings she can't fly so this thing here and we can control it with chemicals and there's a um, you know there's a lot of uh, natural stuff that we can control the varroa mite with so a good beekeeper will keep a watch on these things because they can decimate a hive in real real quick. The hive beetle is another one. This is a little bitty beetle, has a hard shell, so the bees can't sting it because you know it's a hard shell. They get in the cells, start eating the stuff, go through the cells, and it causes the, the liquid in them to run out, and makes a mess, smells horrible. The only way the bees can um, you know, work with them is they have to push them into a, a corner someplace and use some propolis, but that don't work. But the bees do have, uh, the beekeepers do have a treatment for that, for the beetle. But they're just about as bad as the, as the varroa mite. And the bear. This was at my house in 2012, uh, like 1.19 in the morning. This guy comes in start snooping around. He was in there for a long time. And what he did is he just destroyed just about every hive I had. The game warden came out. I showed him, you know, what was going on. And we started trailing where the bear went down through the woods. And evidently he gathered up a bunch and put them under his arm. And he ate eat out of it and throw one aside and one aside. We fall in way down in the woods. But a lot of people think the bear goes in to get the honey, but that's not what the bear is going in there for. The bear is going in to get the brood, the nutrients in the, the brood. But they're not going to turn the honey down when they get in there. They will destroy that thing. So in uh, getting close to the close, I would tell you that the numbers are declining. The bees are losing. We're losing bees. And the beekeeper's average age is 60 years old. I'm 87. So get into beekeeping. We need beekeepers. Uh, bees are dying. The record numbers, like in uh, 1947, like 6 million down in 2013, 2,500,000. And look at all the stuff they pollinate. You know, apples, 90%. Pears, 50%. Blueberries, 90%. Watermelon. Peaches, strawberries, almonds. They actually, almonds, you know, are grown in California, most of them. And beekeepers from this part of the country truck bees to California to pollinate almonds by the 18-wheeler load. Yeah. Any questions? Oh, yes. No, they, 
they will keep using them over and over and over again as long as what happens is the in three or four years down the line the the bees have traveled over to wax so much and the you know when the the honeybee lays an egg in there and it develops into a a larvae and then a pupa it spins a, a cocoon like you know so when they leave that cocoon's left there so the cells get smaller and harder so you do have to replace it periodically but they're good for several years you know they clean them out and brush them up and shine them up for new eggs no um if you well they they start in the bottom box and they, everything goes up you know so when when you start out with a hive you usually start out with one hive body okay and when you get the honeycomb drawn out to maybe one or two left put another box on top of that average beekeeper will keep two hive bodies and then put supers on top of that Supers the first year, you're not going to get anything in them. Yeah, hopefully they'll get enough in there. But if they don't, then you got to make sure there's enough in there. You can put the feeder on with sugar water, right? And you, there's also a way to feed them by, we call it a sugar board, where you mix up 16 pounds of sugar with three um, pints of, three cups of water and a tablespoon of um, vinegar. I think it's vinegar. Mix that all up, put it into a box that you built with a, a hardware cloth bottom on it where the bees can get through it. Put it on top of the brood. The heat in there, the moisture will, you know, loosen up where the bees can eat it. And that will take a bee colony through about three months. So in December is when the guys usually put the sugar boards on. Well, no, you got to have a special box. It's about two inches high with a hardware cloth bottom. Other questions? No? I haven't heard of anything like that. I do put a solution in my sugar water. It's called Honey Bee Healthy. Yeah, I do that. Every time I feed them, I have that in it. Okay, what? The only time that they will make queens, there's two times. If they, know, if they think the queen is not doing her job, in other words, she's not producing enough eggs to keep the colony strong, they will do what they call supersede her. They will take an, a cell or two or three cells and they will start developing queen cells and get a qu queens going. So there's only one queen in the colony. So if, if one, well, they don't, you know, they don't, they don't know, have no idea how many they make. I mean, you saw that one slide that had about eight on it. They die. Because the one that gets out first, I told you the queen has a stinger. The one that gets out first, she goes around stinging them things and kills them. The survivor, yeah. She'll go around. And a lot of times um, after the queen has killed those bees, those queen bees in the cells, the worker bees will go around and open it up and drag the dead queen out. Because they they try to keep everything clean in the hive. Not every year. Every other year. What you do is replace it. You go in and find the queen, and you can send her an old folks home, or you can pinch her head off and throw her away and put the new one in there. Yeah, you can. If you just, if you just took the queen out, threw her away, these bees know they don't have no queen no more within 24 hours. So they will start treating an egg with royal jelly, Make the cell, make a new queen. <laughs> Very gently. <laughs> you hold them in between your fingers. Actually, we have a little tube. Huh? 
Yeah, you can put the put the case the queen and put her in this little tube, and it has a little thing that you can push her up against this mesh and paint her through the mesh. She can cause problems with that too. I did that one time with a queen and um, did the first one okay. When I got to the second one, somehow the the liquid in the pen that I was using flowed. <laughs> it was all over that queen. I don't know if she's, I think she survived, but I don't know how she did it because I had her almost. Uh, well, you don't want to drown her either in paint <laughs> and fix her so she can't move around. There's some questions in the back. I do. Uh -huh. I have, I live on Roseland Road. Do you, know, any, do you know where Roseland Road is? If you go to Aberdeen, where you get your driver's license, right across the street, Roseland Road. It runs between Rose, uh, Aberdeen and Fox Fire Lake. And um, I have, we live about four and a half miles on the left. You'll come to a crossroads, you go through the crossroads and look for Sunny View Farm on the left. Big fields. Well, the, the what you would do is take a beekeeping course and you can do it online or I, I used to teach it. I'm not doing that anymore, but there's a lady at Midnight Bee Supply in Vass who has classes going on almost constantly. She's very good. So take her class. She will tell you all the equipment you need. She will sell you the equipment you need. <laughs> that can get pretty expensive when you first start out. But um, you, you need to learn what you're doing before you start purchasing stuff. Well, you don't order them in the spring. You order them in the winter, so you get them in the spring. Yeah. 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 Oh, they raise bees in cities on top of buildings all the time. But you, if you want to be a beekeeper, you should know what's around you that they can bring in to make honey from or plant something that the picture of the bee with the buckwheat, I'd, occasionally I will plant a big field of buckwheat that they can supplement their food with. Um, around here, they make honey out of poplar, holly, clover, um, buckwheat, spring. In this area here, we have honey flow from like March into June and then it kind of shuts off and we've got what we call a dearth season. It runs from June until October where there's nothing out there that the bees will bring in to make honey with. And then beginning in October, you have fall flowers like aster and a golden rod and stuff like that where the bees can make honey from. So if you're around something like that, you're, you're doing good. If they don't have food, I do. You know, like when you when you go to the first of June and your hive is loaded with honey, you I go around and pick it up, you know, lift it, see how heavy it is. If that thing feels light, I start putting sugar water on there. Because I find that getting bees through the winter is the worst part of beekeeping. Yeah, it's just tricky. And everybody is greedy. They gotta get all the honey they can off that eye. And you know what that does, right? They ain't got nothing left to eat. So you got to put something on there. No, bright, open sun. Yeah. If you put beehives in the shade, that's where the hive beetles like to go. It's mostly the hive beetles. Yeah, that little beetle that gets in there. The bees work better in the hot sun than they were anywhere. I don't know how they do it, but they got to work hard to keep it cool. Oh, yeah, they, they try to take care of her. They got to. Mm -hmm. I have just a quick story to tell. 
So my husband knows that I love bees, and he found this little cute little video on Facebook one time. I'll see if I can find it and put it on our Facebook page along with this slide. But um, you were saying before about the the bug, the mite, that is, if it's in there and eats the larvae, the bee, the bee can be born without wings. Right. Well, there was a video of a woman who found a bee without wings, and she felt really bad for it. So she put her finger down, and the bee climbed up, and she brought it in the car, and she brought a little bit of flowers, and he was just sitting in the flowers while she was driving home. And she got home, and she felt so bad for it, so she kept it as long as she could. She knew they only last for about a month or so. So she had a little, a little teeny cup or a little saucer filled with a little bit of water, and this little bumblebee would crawl up on her husband's um, shoulder while he was on the computer, and there was a scene, it was so funny, on like the carpet on the floor, there was a, a cat. They had a cat in the house. But the cat just stared at the bee as it was climbing up the wall. And they knew, don't touch it. And then this bee, it was so funny, the bee saw the cat. And it was running across the, the carpet as fast as it could, like a big spider or something, towards the cat. But they, they would get flowers and they'd bring it outside. And she'd put it in a couple of flowers. And then she'd pick it up and she'd bring it to another flower. She was trying to like mimic what this bee did. And I just thought that was the sweetest little story because this bee otherwise would have probably just been picked up by a, a bird and killed, yeah, yeah. but it, it actually got to live its little life. And I thought that was just so adorable. Well, you know, um, some years ago when this roller mite got so rampant, uh, wiped out the bees in China and they were actually doing hand pollination, going oh, around wow. the tree, moving the pollen around. It's crazy, and yeah. I, I, I think, I don't know what you think, but I know um, ever since, like, mosquito companies. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I think if mosquito companies are out and they're trying to spray all the mosquitoes in your area, that's great. Now you don't have the mosquitoes, but what other kind of flying bugs now, the, the ladybugs and the bumblebees they're and gonna, everything else? They're going to kill your bees, that's for sure. Yeah. Mosquitoes. And I, I also, um, we watched a TV show called The Bee Czar. Have you seen that? Yeah, I got, I, I've seen him. Yeah, he's pretty good. He's hilarious. He's yeah, out he's, of Texas. He's, and, no, he's not a hilarious. He's crazy. Yeah, he is crazy, but it's hilarious to watch him. Yeah. But he's called the Bee Czar, and it's on TV. I don't know which channel it's on. You'll probably find YouTube it on demand is where or something. I saw it. You did? We watched it on one of the channels. And um, so what he did is he went to some place in, in Texas, in Houston, and said, if somebody finds a hive in their house, in their backyard, in a tree, Instead of calling the exterminator, which will come and kill that hive, if you call a bee expert instead, they can come and try to get that hive, save it, and yep. now you still have more bees. But that's probably another thing is that people just call the exterminator and they get killed that yeah, way. Yeah, well, I had a lady in uh, Whispering Pines call me one time and said, I have honeybees going in my house. I said, how do you know they're honeybees? She said, I had an exterminator come out, and he wouldn't kill them because he said they were honeybees. Oh, wow. I said, okay, so I'll come out and check them. I forgot. About a month later, she called me again. These bees are still going in and out of my house. <laughs> I said, well, give me your address. I'll be right out there right now. So I drove out there, and I, it was like on the back porch. They were going up into the house, and I kept looking at them. I said, they don't look like honeybees. But I, you have a ladder? Yeah. I got the ladder, and I went up there, and they were yellow jackets. Oh, my. And I said, well, what you need to do, you need to call that exterminator, have him come back and kill these yellow jackets and educate him on what a honeybee and a yellow jacket look like. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. <laughs> so we get calls a lot of times, for, you know, be, people have bee swarms in trees or like a lady in um, off of Young's Road called me the other day and she had a swarm that had gone they had wrapped themselves around the trunk of a tree and it was difficult for me to get in to where it was. I told her, I said, I just can't, you know, if I could have got in there, I could have taken a cup and, you know, scraped them off and put them in there and hope to get the queen. But it, I didn't want to take a chance of trying to get across that fence at my age, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to be falling. Does anybody have any other questions? No. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Yeah, so thank you. So if you're interested you. in getting into bees, go take a beekeeping course. You can actually go online and take one online with Dr. Tarpey at NC State. Uh, go. Come to my house. <laughs>
Well, we're there all the time. <laughs> uh, but I do have honey now, yes. What kind? The, buck, the buckwheat? No, I don't have buckwheat honey right now. I've got honey now that was made out of clover, um, um, sunflowers, and I think poplar. You know, they're not choosy about what they get. I mean, if it looks good, they're going to bring it home. Well, thank you so very much. Okay. You guys have a great day. Thank you.